And they're living on the streets. It was a white van, I know my feet. I've seen a flying saucer. Three, two, one. Welcome back to the Lost Frequency Podcast. I'm Tom. And I'm Rye. And today we had Linda and Chris on. And uh, yeah, it was a great podcast. One of my faves, easy. Uh, e- easily my top. E- this is the the best ep- the best uh, one we've done yet so far, in my opinion. Yeah. And uh, so um, well, I guess you'll hear that in a couple seconds here, or in a minute or two. Uh, but Rye, you have a story that you wanted to tell me about uh, something uh, that uh, I'm supposed to be reacting to. Yes. So just the other night, I was sitting here on our rooftop, right where we do our patio. <laughs> Where you do the podcast. Oh my gosh, where we do the patio. No, right where we do the podcast. What was it? I'm on the patio doing the podcast. Oh my gosh. Two strange words to mix up, if you're honest with you. Yeah, patio and podcast. <laughs> but they both start with P. I, th- I guess that's because patio, podcast. Well, the A has the, the A. And, and there's o, an O. There's, there's an O in podcast and patio. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm reaching. I'm yeah, reaching. You're, yeah, hey, uh, hey, you're, I'm, you're swimming. I'm supposed to jump in to help you, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just let me drown. No let problem. me drown with this one. It's okay. terrible. Yeah. Okay, let's let's start over. Okay, so sitting on the the patio talking to my friend. Um, I had all the lights off and looking at the stars. And something in me when I actually came up here was like, you need to keep your eye on the eye on the sky. It's like okay. So talking with my friend, I look over to this one area of the sky, and it was all black before, but now I see a star. And I'm like, I don't remember seeing a star there, but it's a star. So. Yeah, over in that direction. I'm, I'm pointing right now yeah. for all you listeners. Just imagine to that direction. Yeah, right. No, no. West. Yes, there. <laughs> there, right there. Right there. <laughs> okay, so I see this star, but it's moving towards me. And, you know, well, could be an airplane. Ah, satellite. Could, uh, no, no, no. It was it, where it was moving. Like a satellite would be more up higher. You would see it up higher. Oh, okay. This was kind of like coming towards me. And so, of course, my mind went to an airplane. Until it started to get brighter and brighter, and it got fairly bright. Mm-hmm. Um, then, when it hit its peak intensity, mm-hmm. it split. So this one light became two lights, and it. Uh, the best way I can say is it kind of went in an elliptical direction around each other, uh, like an almond shape, and then they came back together. And when they did, it was about two seconds later, disappeared, gone. Whoa. And this happened the other night. This happened the other night. Yeah, I would say, what is that? Monday, Tuesday night. Would you say like out over over that way, about what a kilometer or so? Uh, it, it would look far. It looked far. It far. I would say maybe a couple kilometers. Um, it looked far away. Because this I, area is kind of known for things like that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. There was, uh, and I was telling you that earlier. There was, I think it was in 2017. They filmed, uh, and I forget what it is, but it's like a submerged, unidentified uh, object. Um, that submerge S unidentified U object O S U O. I don't know. Is that I don't ask me. That's is that the right acronym? I'm not aware of. <laughs> but yeah, it was filmed coming out of the water and into the sky, or was it the? It, it could have been vice versa. It could have been you know in from the from the sky flying into the water or flying out. And I'm also aware that in 2006 that the Mexican Air Force also filmed something off the coast of here. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, and I was like. And then when I'm, I didn't know that when I moved here, I was just like, oh, I didn't know. And then I looked, I was like, that's here. And I learned about it back in, you know, whatever that's been almost 20 years ago. And uh, yeah, well, I had an interesting uh, situation yesterday too. Really? Yeah, it was really weird. Okay. So, so let's go, let's just jump into your so situation I, here. Um, we're about to put in a well. And so uh, my daughter is down at the cabin that I built and I'm up. In a different area of the property, about, I don't know, 70 meters away, 100 meters away, something like that. I know where she is. Everything's cool. And I'm water water witching. Um, and uh, so she comes up and she's doing it to, hey, oh, I think it's here. And I'm like, oh, I think it's here. And then, oh, try it here, Dad. And we go down and uh, we're sitting on the tailgate of my truck. I'm drinking a beer. She's drinking her soda, whatever. We're just talking and playing with the dog. And off to the left, the same place where the rock was thrown at me close by if you follow the episodes from before we hear which sounds like 
a meow. Okay. Like a cat. meow. Like like a small cat? And I, no, and I have a cat. Yeah. Uh, my cat's name is Toby. He's a, one of those orange cats. So I, I brought him with me from Germany. And he's out and about all the time. And it's happened before where he meows. And that is called his name and because he's hungry. And he comes over. But the strange thing about it was it kept continuing. And you would hear it like in one position. And then two seconds later, it would be like 20 meters to the right in another position. And then it would sound farther back and then it would sound like it's facing you but also the but hang on hang on though sure yeah so was it like and, ha- <laughs> okay. and we hear a meow okay we're on the rooftop here and as he's telling the story i swear to god i heard a cat meowing and sure enough we have a cat meowing that we we haven't heard before it might be a baby crying though no that was a cat that was oh, definitely a okay. cat um, but yeah. so, so how, how fast were these meows? Like how fast was the, like, how fast, like in between, in between, like, you know, you had one and then was it like, you know, 30 seconds or was it, you know, like 10 seconds? It would, uh, it would, uh, change a little bit. It would be say three in a row with the same interval of time in between. Yeah. And then it would stop and then it would be, you know, yeah, 30 seconds. Yeah. And then it would be like four reasonably the same time. And then it would stop for another five, ten minutes, and then it would start again. And what I would say, I would verbally say, because my daughter is like, what is that? Is that the cat? It sounds like a cat. And she said, when you were up there water witching, I heard the same thing. So I told her, if you don't know what it is, you do not go into the woods. You don't go in and go after it. If you think it's Toby, you let me know, and I'll go into the woods. And, she, and then I was telling her something to worry about. I'm here. You know what I mean? Like, cause she was getting like, this is a little weird dad. And here's the thing. That's another strange uh, aspect of it. It's that the intonation it's, I don't know. It's hard to describe. It sounded very close to a cat meow, but there was something about it that was off. And I can't describe what that is. Interesting. So I kept saying to her, maybe it's a bird because there was moments where I'm like, what is that? And then I would call her. I said, Toby. So I would say, Toby, you either come Toby, come or whatever you are, go away. You are not welcome here. So because again, so listening to this, you're like, okay, that's definitely a cat. That was a cat. That was and a cat. what you were hearing was See, maybe mimicking a cat. Right. And it's, I don't know, it was a little weird. And, and little for, weird. for our listeners who don't know, Tom lives off grid. He lives out in the boonies. <laughs> yeah. He's... What, a couple, there's couple no, miles off, uh, yeah, off the road? about a mile off the road. There's no street lights out there. There's, it's complete pitch black. It's not there. like you're going to find stray cats no. uh, in this area. Well, there is, there is one on the farm next to us, which my cat made babies with. But uh, he does like roam around. And then I asked a person this morning if she's seen him. And she said no. But he, he's known to do that meow and then come and get food. And I would call him and he would always come. Yeah. Or I'd shake his bag of food. But this would not come. Interesting, interesting. It was whatever. strange. It was definitely unusual. That is a cool story. So, speaking of stories and strange and unusual. Yeah, what, what do you mean? I'm well, a, why a, don't, uh, you know, if our listeners, if you guys have any strange. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 I was trying try try, to cue try, yeah, you, you up there to right, see if yeah. you would uh, bite on that one. But no. no, no. 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 So, it, it, full. <laughs> <laughs> so, if any of our listeners have uh, any stories, you know, you can reach out to us, uh, email at uh, the lost frequency podcast at gmail.com or you can find us on our uh, facebook you can find me at tom franklin and you can just uh, dm me you can stay anonymous yeah uh, you can tell me anything you can you know say hi uh anything's you know anything's possible we're just trying to get you to tell your stories and um yeah and get, and get your experiences out there maybe you know you just write me it uh write me the story I mean, we say it on the end of the podcast at the end or if you have enough of them we'll put you on the show yeah, exactly. Um, or hit me up, Rai Voss, on Facebook. Or we have our group, uh, the Lost Frequency Podcast uh, Facebook group, where you can join in on the conversation. You know, like it, uh, follow us, and you'll see us when we post our our episodes, which of course is every Thursday. And you know, we post a, some memes. You know, we encourage our people, uh, our followers, yeah, right, to. Uh, right. Either way, in, anyway, if you have something you want to say and you want to say it to us, we're open. To, we're open for that. Exactly. Yeah. And remember, you're listening to the Lost Frequency Podcast, where we bring the periphery into focus. Okay, this time minus the motorcycle. (laughs) And remember, we are the Lost Frequency Podcast, where we bring the periphery 
into focus. All right, today on the Lost Frequency podcast, we're here with Chris Parsons and Linda Sigmund. So please tell us a little bit about yourselves and where our listeners can find you and anything else that you'd like to share. Um, my name is Linda Sigmund, and I grew up in Pomeroy, Ohio, and um, I've been a psychic and empath practically all my life. I've seen spirits since the age of three. I've seen my first ET at the age of five. Uh, I saw my guardian angel at three. Um, let's see, I saw a Mothman when I was 16. And then um, I'm losing it. No, you're do. You are doing fine. You are doing fine. Yes, you're doing fantastic. Okay. Uh, I started reading people, uh, and I found high school was kind of hard for me because I would be called strange, witch, um, oddball. So I had a hard time until I graduated. And then after I got married and had kids. Um, kind of put it to the side a little bit. And then uh, I started reading people when I was about 40. Uh, it used to get on my kids' nerves so bad that, you know, they'd say, Mom, stop, please stop. So now when I go in the grocery store or someplace and I run into somebody that I feel needs a little extra help, I will get a certain look on my face and my daughter will say, Go ahead, Mom, do your thing. <laughs> I'm going over here and look at the clothes. So I went to Sonoma a few years back and had all kinds of interesting um, experiences there. There was one girl that uh, I saw her sitting by herself. So I went to be with her and I started talking to her and, and I said, your mother has just passed. And I said, uh, I told her her mother's name and I told her that she wanted her to know that uh, she wanted her to enjoy her vacation that she was with her. And that stuff just rolls off my tongue. I went to Bimini. Anytime I'm around water, it seems like it, it flows. And uh, so it's so nice. That's such a nice thing to go to a complete stranger and tell them that someone that they love is thinking about them. I think that's a wonderful yeah, thing. I don't usually get anything negative. I usually, it's usually positive, but when I had my encounter with Mothman, I think that's when it started. And uh, it was kind of like it was downloaded into me. Oh, interesting. From 16 on. And the older I get, uh, the more it, more I become open and, and aware of it. Yeah, like the more it manifests is what you're saying. You know, you, you were kind of given something like a like a gift almost. And now it keeps like expanding and getting bigger and becoming more in, intense. Or the intensity is picking up perhaps maybe. I don't know. I think when you reach a certain age too, you uh, – you, it's not that you don't care what people think. You don't care what people are really judging you and you become less judgmental yourself. I totally, I totally agree with that. Yeah. It, it you seem to not care as much. It's just like, I don't know. Not everybody, you know, you have that, you have that crotchety old man. There's a, <laughs> you know, there's a certain guy that you think of you know, the grumpy old guy, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but I, I would say on my behalf, well, I don't know if I'm becoming a grumpy old man or not, but I, I think, uh, yeah, there's some, uh, <laughs> very very nice of you thank you thank you <laughs> i don't see it in your future <laughs> either one of you <laughs> but uh i i think you mellow as you get older and then you allow yourself to uh see different things that and it's like looking through a glass you know used to be foggy but now it's the older i get the more clear i get and I'm not afraid of death and uh do you think that maybe through the years, uh, with you using this um, uh, this uh, example that you're using, uh, do you think that you become more empathic through the years? Absolutely. Every year, every minute, every day. And I think the more you, uh, it, just like any other gift that you have, the more you use it, the more, the easier it comes and more confident you become in knowing who you are and you, you embrace it. When you're empathic, do you sense like other people's emotions? Yeah, I had a hard time with that in school. Um, little kids that would, uh, you know, ha be having trouble or crying and stuff. You know, I would cry and, and then I'd get so I didn't want to go to school. But And then I finally figured it out by the time I graduated, what was going on? And see, I graduated when I was 17. So I had my Mothman experience uh, 
in the spring when I was 16 and uh, just felt like something was downloaded in my mind or uh, had some kind of epiphany to add to the experience that it uploaded something and uh, it continues. It's continued for 60 years, <laughs> 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's amazing. So why don't we direct that into, uh, tell us about your Mothman experience uh, at 16 years old. Cause that's, that's young. And you know, for an experience like that, especially, I don't know, do, well, I'll let you tell the story. I'm, I'm interested to know if you actually shared it with anybody, or if you kept it, uh, you know, kind of as a secret for a while. I kept it as a secret because my parents asked me to. In that generation, you weren't as open with things like that. And coming from a small town like we did, um, you got labeled real quick. You know, oh, you're crazy. They're having trouble with her kid. You know, they can't control her. She's blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, I, I more or less kept it to myself. I, I grew up on the Ohio River. And like I said before, I think anytime you live near water or go near water, it's it's a... An, a surreal experience and I think that uh, the more I read the more I understand that it's easier for spirit to uh, you know to manifest itself through the water and you even see UFOs now the submergible objects in the water there's there's some kind of uh, connection the yeah, connection going on there real easily so I grew up yeah th- there was one uh, there was one film just out like we're right on the ocean and there was one that was filmed uh coming out of the out of the ocean here oh i would like to see that about 2017 i think it uh, was filmed mm-hmm. oh okay I, I was still in germany so i'm cool oh wow <laughs> <laughs> you guys remember the shag harbor incident no i don't no i don't shag harbor and british columbia <laughs> i should know that <laughs> it's a it's a famous it's a famous UFO, it's a famous ufo case um, where a UFO was submerged in British Columbia and they were able to track it. They actually have a memorial there. If you ever look it up, Shag Harbor UFO incident, it's incredible. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the most, um, it's one of the most well-investigated uh, UFO mass sightings of all time. Uh, and one that they've done documentaries on. And you can, you Google it, you'll, you'll see a lot. But yeah, the water, the water and UFOs and all manner mm-hmm. of, uh, phenomenology is you know water is life and and it and i think the the phenomena definitely responds to water there's no doubt to bring it back to mothman mothman was i think i don't know if it was originally seen but it was originally seen in point pleasant west virginia and you lived on the other side of the river in ohio yes and that was our old hunting grounds i guess (laughs) or hunting grounds and we would go down there a lot you know on weekends and uh, we had friends down there it's about 25 minutes or 20 25 minutes from where i lived and the incident i had took place um directly across the river from where i lived and i lived by the pomeroy mason bridge which is still standing at that and um point pleasant bridge the silver bridge that fell was a suspension bridge and but um, uh, it fell, and then they built a new one to get to it. But uh, it's so odd. I think that you know the UFOs, all those uh, months that they saw the UFOs and Mothman, it was always up and down the river, always by the water. Tell me your story. So, um, my boyfriend lived across the river from me in Mason. That's where I was born, and it was just less than a mile from from my house and so uh it was a early spring on april evening in 1967 and he picked me up and uh we decided just to run around in the he had a horse and we used to ride it but uh he had a 56 chevy so he said let's go ride the back roads you know and and see what we can find so he said i'm going to take you to this special place where um i'm going to help a farmer this summer and do some hay and so if you're familiar with small town america uh and especially mason west virginia and pomeroy ohio uh they both directly face the river they face each other so you know and, and there's back roads so we took the back roads and uh it was about 7 30 going on eight and it wasn't dark yet but uh we got around the corner it was probably two miles from town and uh he said, I'm going to pull off this dirt road. We were on a dirt 
a gravel road. And I'm going to pull off and let's get this quilt that I got in the back and we'll put it across the front of the car and we'll get up on the hood and we'll sit and we'll watch the stars. It's a beautiful night, you know. Hmm. So that's what we did. And uh, we're sitting there for about 20 minutes talking. I hadn't dated him too long. And we're getting to know each other. And uh, all of a sudden, I saw him keep looking over on his to his left. And I said, what you looking at? And I turned and looked. And I saw what looked like a, a big star in the sky. And I said, oh, are you watching that star? That that's Is that a planet? What is that? And he said, I've been watching it for about 20 minutes. And I said, really? And I said, look at it. Because it would... It was like pulsing in and out and in and out. And each time it pulsed, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was just like the sky exploded or something came through another dimension. And the sky was red with the clouds were red. And we were looking through treetop or I, I level trees. Though. There wasn't very many leaves on the trees that time of year. And uh, I said, look at that thing. It's, it's starting to move. So it started moving. And we were sitting and looking over to our left, and it moved oh, pretty slow, like at a walk pace, you know, just slow. But it was gigantic. I mean, it was like like a full moon, bright red, glowing, no, no noise, but like when you get, you know, down around the beach and you see the full moon or a super moon, how big it is, that's how big that thing was. And it was, it was just moving like parallel with us. Well... He's like, well, I don't know what we're going to do. And it got out to the highway that we had pulled off on and we were headed out so we could easily get out. And the next thing I know, because I had some lost time and the next thing I know, uh, it was right over top of us, this gigantic UFO. And by that time it was dark underneath and it had lights like in the form of a cross, red and white blinking lights and I leaned out and looked up uh, from the passenger side of the car and I could not see the sky a thing was that big and it was that low it was about tree top high and it was just sitting there and I'm like well yeah we're dead <laughs> it happened so quick <laughs> and I was so young that I didn't I wasn't really afraid but I knew it was something I had never seen before and I knew it wasn't a helicopter. That's what goes through your mind. What is it? What is it? What isn't it? And that's a that's a UFO. I had, I had started reading some books about that uh, subject prior to that, but you know it's just fascinating and stuff. But uh, I never dreamed we'd see something like that. So the next thing I know, um, we're in the car. This is after my lost time, which I'll tell you about here in a few minutes. But next thing I know, we were in the car and he's trying to get the car going. And uh, the thing's still sitting there and it's just going. And I'm thinking it's going to suck us right up in it. And uh, and he's trying to start the car. He finally gets the car started and he starts to pull out. But, you know, and gravel were flying and we're, we're trying to get out of there. And I'm hanging out the driver's side window because I wasn't afraid of anything and I'm like look at that and he's what he's like I'm trying to get out of here and uh he started pulling forward and the thing pulled forward with us and to my right I saw this gigantic creature it was like a large man it was all black it was about between eight and nine feet long and you know the old uh, shows of Superman where he flies. When he's flying, his um, arms are back. <laughs> and uh, But that's what that thing did. It it jumped up and it flew uh, just at a, what, about a 45-degree angle up into the trees to my right. And, and my boyfriend's trying to, to make a quick left turn and get onto the, the blacktop. And I'm yelling, look at that thing. Look at it. Do you see it? Do you see it? And he said, I see it. I see it. And I said, no, that, that creature, that man, can't you see it? And I, I was watching it. He was trying to drive. I was trying not to fall out the window and the thing flew up in the trees and it stood there and turned around 
I didn't see its eyes. Uh, I don't know what I'd have done if I'd have seen its eyes. But seeing it, just in, in it was dusk. It wasn't real dark, yet the UFO gave off enough light that I could tell, you know, the shadow, what that thing was. And I don't, if it wasn't Mothman, I don't know what it was. So we go on down the road. Sorry, mm-hmm. did it? Did it have like, you said it had wings then, right? And when it flew, yes. were mm-hmm. the wings moving or was it kind of more like like, like a cape no. behind it or something along that? I don't know. Or like gliding with it. It was like, it didn't have a cape. It just looked like, you know, like that. It it just went and uh, like, from a stand. Yeah, like Superman just taking off of a building. Like Superman. Yeah. <laughs> like, Able to leap tall buildings yeah. in a single bound. I mean, he just went, Phew! and I'm like dumbfounded because I'm like, that's a thing that everybody's seeing. That's not a bird. That's not a bird. Right, because the reporting started a year before in 66. It started in, I think, November of 66. And we were young and silly, and we'd go down there and sit at the TNT area and and party and, and, you know, play music and watch for the lights. And we saw things in the sky, but we, you know, we made so much racket that nothing was going to come down there. But when we, when I saw that. Linda, I have a question about the car. Your boy, you said that your boyfriend had a, a difficulty starting the car. Was that a normal thing or was it because of the situation? No, it, it was some kind of an electrical uh, interference because Uh, As soon as it started going, then the car started. Uh, It knew that we were trying to get out of there. Whoa. And (laughs) yeah, yeah. And, uh, but to be that close to something like that, and I was in shock and awe, I guess you call it. Yeah. And anyway, we went on down the road about a half a mile and parked in this old uh, abandoned uh, strip mine area. And we turned around and we're, facing so we could get out of there in a hurry if we had to. And I said, I want to go back up there. I want to see that thing again. He said, it was a UFO and it's gone. And I said, no, I want to see that man. I want to see that Mothman thing again. He said, you didn't see anything. And I said, you didn't see it because you were driving. And I said, I was hanging out the window so I could see it. (laughs) And I said, it flew up in the trees and I'm going to go back. And we decided we'd go home because looked at our clock and it was like 8 30 and it's like we weren't up there an hour it gives me such a visual linda you're a 16 year old young vibrant woman hanging out <laughs> of a 1956 bel air and there's moth band flying by i love it that's yep, that, that's the goes. cover to your book right there <laughs> yep oh man i tell you this that's not the end of it we were sitting there and uh i said this is moon supposed to come up tonight he said, I, I don't know. And I said, there's something coming up over the road. And I said, oh, there's cars coming. We need to leave because we shouldn't be sitting here like this. And uh, here come this ball. It was about the size of a small car, a Volkswagen. A brilliant white light. Uh, it was sort of like fluorescent, fluorescent light. And it come up over the hill the ridge of that road and it was about three feet above the road um and it was moving real slow just like that great big thing was and uh we were sitting there and the car was off and it came right over our left shoulder we turned and looked or right yeah our left shoulder turned and looked and it was just, it stopped. It saw us and I'm like, we're dead now because it sent something out after us or something. So here it come creeping down the road. And I said, well, you know, so it came and it stopped right at the front bumper of the car and it just sat there. And uh, we just sat and looked at it. And uh, I was telling someone last night, it was like, it wasn't just a ball of light. It was like it was alive. Like it was radiating life. But it wasn't something to be feared. I didn't feel like it was a devil. I didn't feel like it was an angel. Um, but I didn't feel like it was mechanical. 
I felt like it was an entity in itself. And so I'm not sure how long we sat there and looked at it, but we tried, we talked a little bit about it, not much. We didn't really try to communicate with it, but I felt like it was either being something was downloaded in my mind. He said he felt the same way. Um, we both have native American blood. He's, he was about, I think, well, his grandma, I think was a full blooded Cherokee and it's back about six generations in mine on both sides, the Shawnee. And, uh, I don't, I don't know, but anyway, it went through, all of a sudden it just went from nothing to going right up over the car and right up over a hit. And by this time I was on the floor of the car and on, in the front and, uh, he was kind of slumped over the, the steering wheel. And I said, what happened? He said, I don't know. And we both got out at the same time and looked around. It was nothing. Nothing was there. Wow. That's uh, so, that is incredible. I, it doesn't stop, it doesn't there. stop there. Oh, I have so many questions. I have yeah. so many questions, but I will hold off. I'm going to hold off. No, you can ask oh. me. Yeah, before we, before uh, we lose, we lose them because yeah, yeah. before we lose consciousness, <laughs> before, like, before like she so most sober. probably they will ask that question. <laughs> uh, like, okay. Now you know why I'm not afraid of anything. That's the only thing I'm afraid of. Uh, I'm not afraid of spiders. I'm not afraid of snakes. I'm not afraid of heights. I'm not afraid of water. But I don't think I want to see Mothman anymore. Fair enough. <laughs> so we decided to go home. I didn't want to tell my mom I was up on a hillside parking with my boyfriend. <laughs> Why? So Why not? Went, <laughs> Why? <laughs> mom, mom yeah, I, you know. I swear we saw a UFO. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't have to explain that because we went across the bridge. And as we were going across the Mason Bridge, which was just a couple miles from where we had been, but he had to take me home, and and I'm like, what are you gonna? I feel funny, and he said, I do too. I said, I feel like, like the exact words I said. I feel my brain has been has been picked. He said, I know what you mean. I said, I'm not afraid. I'm not unhappy. Uh, I'm in awe, but I feel like something's been downloaded into my to my subconscious. So we get down to the to my house, which is just another, just right at the end of the bridge and down over the hill by the river. And my parents are sitting on the front porch. We had a, a great big porch that overlooked the river. My dad gets up and runs to the car and I'm like, how'd he know where we were? <laughs> and he runs out the car. He goes, oh my gosh, hurry up, come here. And I'm like, well, well, what, well what is it? He said, your mom and I were sitting on the front porch looking directly across the river, which was where we were, just a mountain there. We were on the other side of it. He said this big white ball came up over the Wahama High School, which is right there across from our house. It came up over the Wahama High School, went up the river, up over the bridge, moved slowly, and went to Pomeroy. Like, well, Daddy, you know what happened to me? And I got up on the porch. He said, come up here and sit and tell me. And my mom was there and the phone rang. And uh, at that time, we didn't have cell phones. We had landlines. She came out and she said, your grandmother, she lived up uptown about three miles from our house, up the river. She said to hurry, run out. There's a UFO up there. It's coming down your way. So there were at least two scouts or whatever you want to call it. And the big UFO and the Mothman. So that was the beginning of my life. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? There's so I, many, yeah. so many things in one night, you know, in like a couple of hours. I think this is yeah. the definition of rendered speechless mm -hmm. in trying to collect my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have some questions I've been what? writing down. I have some questions I've been writing down. Okay. Okay. So being that you were saying, you told us that you're an empath, do you believe that maybe helped yeah. you like somehow connect with this? We'll say the ball of light. We'll talk the ball of light first. Okay. Yeah. I think it was an entity. And at the time I thought that thing looks more alive than a street light or a lamp or, 
you know, some kind, it made no noise whatsoever, nothing, but it felt like it, I felt like it was trying to communicate. But back then we didn't have the computers like we do now. I didn't know anything about uploading or downloading information. All I could feel like was that it was picking my brain. So yeah, uh, I like, think it was like, like your mind is being read and then like somehow upgraded afterwards or something. Yeah. Like it, mm-hmm. it sends something in you. It wanted to know about you. And then it gave you maybe this uh, ability to read others like it was doing to you. Yes. Okay. Whoa. And and maybe like you were saying that it wasn't like good, bad, maybe like, were you reading maybe that it was curious? Is that kind of like, you know, like a, an entity that was more interested in curiosity, we'll say. Yeah. I, we were two good looking kids. I mean, he was real dark, you know, and I was kind of light and, you know, they took us, I think. I don't know. I was regressed. <laughs> and that's going to take us into my my next question of lost time. You had said there was something about lost time. And I know this is big with a lot of uh, UFO uh, abductions where it's just like next thing you know, you're you're back in a spot. And you're like, what just happened? And where I still time shake. I'm, I'm, I'm nervous now because of it. <laughs> Yeah, you probably, I'm sure when you relive it every time, it it brings up an emotion. I, I know what you're talking about. So just, just you know. I love it and- though, because I think I, I've experienced something that not a, a lot of people have, but more so lately. I uh, waited 50 years to uh, at least, maybe a little more, to get a hold of somebody. And I've got a, finally got a computer. And I thought, what am I going to do? So I started searching and I found the round town UFO society. Here's my plug. <laughs> uh, right. We meet right, sure. once a month on Thursday at uh, uh, the, what is it? The third Thursday of every month, the third Thursday of every month. In at, Circleville, Ohio. Uh, what is the name of that place? The, it's not armory. It's oh, it, it's the uh, Legion, I believe. Okay. The American Legion in Circleville. Okay the third Thursday at six o'clock from six until nine. So I put in a plea to them and uh, they invited me to come up and tell them the story. And after I was a member there for a while, they said, we'd like you to be regressed. And I'm like, well, I've never really thought about it before, but yeah, that'll be all right. So there's a lady named Lainey Ebright and she is a, hypnotist and a psychologist she's retired now but uh, very sweet person and you can see my regression on on the round town ufo society homepage under linda's story and so i got to know i knew laney a little bit through round town she came to some of the meetings and so i went one, up one time and uh, this man that at the particular time i was engaged to he went to and he filmed it And uh, she put me under, and every time I tell the story, I kind of relive it. And sometimes I close my eyes so that I can see it, so I can get a better vision. So I was kind of used to, you know, thinking about it a little bit. So she found out that what happened was I told her that we were sitting on the car. I remember uh, he jumped out off. I don't know where he went. I slid off because when he jumped down, the quilt fell. And I remember burning my leg on the front of the car because it was still hot. So I was sitting there rubbing my leg. <laughs> and I looked down and I saw these two big feet. And I'm like, oh. And, you know... <laughs> The more I learn about uh, cryptids and and all these things I've been hearing in my life, I think they're all interrelated somehow. To me, that looked like Bigfoot feet. It was like, what? Was he a shapeshifter? You know? At that time, I didn't know what a shapeshifter was, but I started watching Skimwalker Ranch. You know, you try not to form opinions. You try to, to weigh 
your story. You try to listen to other people talking. You try to learn from it and learn by it. But when I came home, I drew pictures, and I have a picture of me sitting on the quilt on the ground, and there's these two big feet in front of me and two legs. That thing picked me up. It pulled him out of the car because that's where he was. It threw me in without hurting me into the driver's or the passenger seat of the car, put him in, and away we went. But I don't know what happened in the meantime. Uh, this came out during the regression? Yes. Yeah. And I remember it. I remember it now. And I was a mess for a while afterwards. Um, but what saved me was it didn't hurt me. It didn't hurt me. Um, whatever had a hold of me didn't hurt me. So, but Lainey wanted me to come back because she said, I know there's more. There's more you need to, to, to get out, of, you know. But I didn't. I didn't. Um, it took taken me a couple of years to, that was. I can imagine. I can imagine. Five years ago, maybe. And uh, a lot's happened to me since then. I went through a divorce. And... Linda, that's a lot to digest. That's a lot to digest. <laughs> you haven't heard the half of it. <laughs> but that's that's most of my moth, man. It's like they, they open these doors, you know, to this, ex is this experience that you thought, well, I've, mm -hmm. I've dealt with, like I was able to, you know, digest that experience of what happened. And now they open these doors to say, no, 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 no. There's a little bit more. Blood gates. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And then all the. Um... You want that now or do you want that later? <laughs> you Would you like for me to tell you what, what else happened? Yeah, sure, whatever you'd like to tell definitely. us. Definitely. Yeah. So we had all, we had all summer and uh, he wouldn't talk about it. So we just more or less talked to a few friends and other friends saw things, but they didn't see none of my other friends saw Mothman. And my dad said, keep your mouth shut. There's government men down there searching around, which I guess was, uh, you know, that was knowledge uh, from um, Mary Heyer. She uh, was with uh, the Galplis Gazette and the Athens, Ohio newspaper, The Messenger. So my parents got that and they knew what all was going on. I wish I'd have saved all those papers. But anyway, um, it come right before Christmas, right before the bridge fell. And uh, I've decided I wanted, I had a car. I wanted to go to Point Pleasant. I wanted to go Christmas shopping. And you have to go from Gallipolis, Ohio, over to Point Pleasant. You have to go across the Silver Bridge. That is a, was a suspension bridge, and it swung like a giant swing, like you see in, uh, like at the fair, you get in the swings and they go back and forth. So anyway, I'm sitting in the middle of that bridge. I'm sitting in the middle of that bridge and it's swinging. And I'm thinking that thing's going to go all the way over. This was two weeks before the bridge collapsed. And, I'm like, and it was full of cars, you know, and I'm right out in the middle of it. It's Christmas time and the lights are on. And and uh, so I go. I want to go to shop over in Point Pleasant. So that's what I do. And I finally get over there. And I pull up in front of the, the store that I want to go in. And uh, I park. And there's a man standing out front and he's weird he he has black suit black pants black hat and sunglasses at night and he's leaning with his one foot against the side of that building and he just got his arms crossed and i'm like you know i gotta go in that store and that weird guy's standing there so i waited as people coming and going and looking at him he didn't do anything so i went past him and i went by and kind of nodded at him and everything and he didn't do anything so i think like, well this guy's weird and i went in the store and and made some purchases and i came out i looked out the window and he was still standing there and uh, i looked up the road to my left and looked down the road to my right and there was another one leaning against a lamp post looked just like him one very tall five six or so dressed all in black and i i noticed from the lights of the store that his skin was like a pallor looking uh sort of uh it didn't have an asian really complexion but just grayish color kind of greenish gray didn't and i 
folk kind of nodded and said hi and he just acted like he didn't see me act like you know so i thought well that's fine so i i, I just went home and i went straight home i thought i'm done with this so um that must have been uh, it was about two weeks before the bridge collapsed my sister was going to get married um let's see the bridge collapsed on the uh, 15th, I think, of December 1967. And we had a party at school that we were preparing for. And uh, we were, went early and were getting decorations and stuff ready. And uh, prior to that, I got up that morning and uh, I told my mom, I said I had the most terrific dream. And my dreams seemed to uh, be getting wilder and wilder all the time. And I dreamed that all these packages were floating in the river or in the water. And I could hear people screaming and children yelling and and uh, metal crushing against metal and cars and honking and lights going crazy. And I woke up and she said, oh, Linda, you just you just had a nightmare, you know, just just go on with your day and don't worry about it. So then I went to the party and. Someone came in and said, the band isn't going to be be here. They're, they may even be in the river because the silver bridge collapsed. And we're like, oh, you're kidding. And come to find out, I think they had to come up through Mason, West Virginia from Point Pleasant because, because of all that was going on there. If they'd have been a little bit earlier, they'd have been on that bridge. They'd have probably come up that way. The road was better. Can I ask a question? You, your, your, okay. Your father said that you should keep your uh, lips, your mouth closed, or sealed tight um, because there was military around the area. Is there a military base close by? Mm-hmm. Um, the TNT plant—that's what it was. It was a munitions storage area during World War II. The bunkers there were like igloos. They're still down there, and you can go in them which is very creepy. The acoustics in there are, are amazing. If you go in there and sing or play an instrument or, you know, you sound like, you know, somebody famous. <laughs> it's uh, My son is a band director and music teacher. And, you know, uh, I followed him around and know a little bit about acoustics and, and sound and stuff and the way it radiated. But yeah, um, every time when I was little. Yeah, I was just trying to throw a line in the water because... It's very, because mm-hmm. I believe you were describing men in black. Is this what the. Um, That's what I believe it was. Yeah. Very. Right. Acting. So you have the military walking mm-hmm. around. You have this base. Mm-hmm. Who knows what's going on there? Mm-hmm. And then you have the men in black leaning on posts, kind of just checking out the area. And then, right. Something that maybe you can talk to, uh, about is the, you had a. A premonition. Yeah, a premonition. Yeah, your, your, your dreams, your premonition dreams. Mm-hmm. Yes. Your, I do all the uh, time. Th- those are very interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I do as well, too. I, I feel like I know Tom and I have mm-hmm. talked about this. I I would say if I have a gift, it's mm-hmm. my dreams. Um, and and how, how many of these dreams would you say you had? You said you had kind of like it was building up and getting more and more intense, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you had this dream of like packages floating in the water, you know, of course, around Christmas. That was the that was the most prophetic one that I had at the time. I didn't know until uh, the Mothman Prophecies by John Keel came out. I couldn't wait to get the book and that there were other people that had that dream. And I, I, I was shocked. There were people that I know uh, that saw Mothman had that dream. And I'm like, there has to be a correlation. There has to be something that, that is connecting all of us. I met Faye DeWitt at a Mothman festival. She um, she speaks down there now. And uh, we sat and talked for quite a while and, and told each other our stories. And she said, I'm related to Chief Cornstalk. And I said, he's my sixth great-grandfather. And she said, he's my sixth great-grandfather or, you know, relative. I'm like, is there a Native American connection? And then, if you know anything of the history... Mm, Like you mentioned earlier. If you know anything of the history of the area with Chief Cornstalk and the the Indian, French and Indian Wars and the American Revolution, you know, how um, 
he went to get he went to make peace and to sign a contract and he was sabotaged and killed along with one of his sons and a couple other of his um mates and uh he it's always been said that he put a curse on the property and everything for 200 years but i mean how would anybody really know but then again they knew he was living maybe somebody knew they had it the 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 speech verbatim you know uh word by word and uh, it was like i don't know if that's so or not i i just know that um i had a great let's see it was my grandpa's first cousin so she would have been maybe a second cousin once removed to me or something anyway she worked for the the government and she decided to do our family tree on the castos and then it went casto which was my grandpa and then it went shoemaker which was his mother and then on and on back to the shoemakers and uh catherine vanderpool c who was uh the fifth wife uh, one of the fifth wives of, of chief Bornstall. so it was Linda, so maybe you're suggesting that the Mothman and this whole, this very uh, interesting tale that you're uh, trying to weave together. I know it's difficult. There's a lot that mm-hmm. I'm trying to follow and you're doing a great job, by the way. I mean, I can see you're thinking, oh, no, no. I, do, are you trying to <laughs> I'm stay? getting redder and redder as we no, go. You're cause doing you're... a great job. Maybe you should take a drink of water because <laughs> you, um, are you, are <laughs> oh, you something saying? stronger. But... <laughs> Are you possibly saying? I think that instead of a that it was a curse, he tried to save us. Right. I don't think it was a curse. Like Mothman was there giving you warnings. He was trying to like he was a herald, like he was a herald of uh, he of was this disaster. A... Like and 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 those dreams were given out as like oh. maybe not as a of the bridge, uh, yeah, of a, yeah. Like a communication. Oh. Like may, maybe this, like you need to go home. You don't need to be down here. This yes. is frightening you. Exactly. Uh, you're not to be afraid. I'll pick you up. I'll save you. I'll put you in the car. But you're not to be afraid. Your family. My dad is. My dad's of Welsh descent. So I didn't notice your imp- your empathic abilities gave you something. Mm-hmm. You have a premonition dream, and then two weeks later. The freaking bridge fell into the Ohio River? That's right. Holy crap. <laughs> My sister got married the next day. So uh, so it's, it was a lot of excitement. I feel like my head's going to blow up. Uh, it's just part of my life. I see my service dog. She knows. <laughs> uh, she does. She's I, I would have to say that this is probably one of my favorite like, <laughs> stories, stories <laughs> ever. Yeah. Ever? Yeah, I'm... It, My life just it, gets it, it, better and better. So <laughs> uh, well, let's that, go ahead and put that in the ever yeah. section of the store or whatever. <laughs> wow. That's just my moth, man. I mean, I've seen spirits all my life. Uh, I can tell when spirits are in the room. Before we started, I saw a um, an orb. I've seen him several times here in the house, about the size of a quarter. And uh, Chris was trying to get the computer going and it went from uh, over my left and, and down this way. I was like, oh, dear. <laughs> Who's here tonight? <laughs> exactly. I was thinking someone's visiting. Someone's there to visit. Yes. Yeah, Maybe they, knew that you, they knew that you were going to talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to go to Mexico. I love it down there. Oh, yeah. I'm so jealous. But, uh, that This is amazing. Like, I, I'm... Oh, fantastic. There's so much, so many things that are in, in your story. It's like, and, <laughs> and last, actually one last question, that glowing orb that was approaching you, you said it was about the size of a Volkswagen? Yes. And it was using the road? It came about three feet above the road and it used the road. It followed the road. Mm-hmm. It followed the, the little road that we were to go out onto. And then when it got parallel with us, we both turned and looked and it was like, it was like, oh, there you are. And it started coming down, which was probably about 30 yards and just moved so slow and right over to us. Like it didn't want to scare us, but it wanted to, to tell us or communicate or something. Or maybe it just wanted to make sure we were okay. To recollect again, you woke up in the floorboard and your boyfriend was slumped over the steering wheel? Well, neither one of us were really asleep, I don't think. Uh, well, I was on the floor. I was on the floor. 
uh, I just, by that time, when I saw it start to come into the car, when it went up over the car like this and up over us, I, I was on the floor and he was hiding his face and oh. we both, I see, I yeah. see. Like he was kind of like Who's cowering like, oh by the street. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't know what it was going to do, but it hadn't hurt us so far and everything we'd been through and everything we felt, we just felt like going to sleep for a long time. Felt really good, but felt like I knew something. I didn't know what, but it was something, something. And then for my parents and grandparents to have seen the thing just immediately, you know, after I was like confirmation, confirmation. yeah, that, that is confirmation. Right. It's like you know, even if you had like, like, am I questioning this that it really happened? Even if you had yeah. that doubt in your yeah. mind when you're when someone's like, oh yeah, I saw it too. You know, did you see this? And it's yeah. just like, and that's everyone within her family. I'm wondering how many people in the community saw um, it. Went to school. I went to school a couple days after that, and uh, there was these twins that lived upon a high hill, overlooking Pomeroy, and they. So I heard him talking at school. Our dad and I were walking up on Lincoln Heights, it was called. There was a water tower up there, and they were just walking up the road to the water tower. And there was a big, round, white ball sitting right above the water tower. It was there. For, I have talked to other people. It had been around for two weeks. Every night, about 3.30 in the morning, the thing would come from out. If you get a, a map, you can see how uh, there is a bypass, which wasn't, I don't think, at that time. But it was old Route 7 and 33 that come from Athens. And that thing would come about, if you were standing up on the, the hill overlooking the river, you'd be looking at it high level. It would go up the river and around the smokestack, back down every night like clockwork. And there were these people that lived beside my grandma and grandpa that saw it one night they called and told them it was out there. And that's the night that I saw it, but it was there earlier. It was later. I mean, that day, that night. And that's, that's when stuff started culminating, you know? And, and of course, everybody, if you're saying at three 30, you know, that's the witching hour as everyone calls it, you know, that is, yeah. that's when yeah. the veil is the thinnest when spirit is supposed to be coming out at three o'clock, three 33. Yeah. Three 33. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Mm. Very interesting. Mm. Tying with the Masons 33. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They probably know all about yeah, it. I, I agree. I um, agree. But, it's, it's not, I don't think it's, I think the Masons are stealing that is what it, in, in my, oh. uh, you know, is that what they're doing? Yeah. Oh. They, they, they know numerology better than most do and they, uh, they use it to their advantage. My grandpa was a mason. Both of them were on both sides. Interesting. Wow. Hello out there listeners of the Lost Frequency Podcast. It's me, Tom, asking you for your help. How can you help, you ask? Well, that's pretty simple. All you have to do is go to wherever you download your podcast, whether that be Podbeam, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or all the other numerous podcast apps that you can use. Leave us a rating. Review, share, subscribe, you know the deal. Every little bit helps. Doesn't cost you one red cent, but it means the world to us. By the way, if you have an interesting story, whether it be about cryptids, spooky stuff, the time you saw that shadow figure at your grandma's house, conspiracies, whatever, and you want to share it with us, well, we'll be looking forward to seeing and hearing from you. All you have to do is shoot us an email at the Lost Frequency Podcast at gmail.com. And who knows, maybe one day you will be on the Lost Frequency. Now we have Bigfoot activity out here. So you might want to talk to Chris about that. Um, I moved out here in the country of West Virginia. I lived for almost 50 years uh, after I got married on a farm, got divorced, and then I moved out here. And since 2017, I've been having Bigfoot activity. The only time I saw the big thing was one night when I took my dog out. It was about 10 o'clock at night. Uh, we live on the side of a hill. In, um, in the woods, we have neighbors, but they're about 30 to 50 yards away. And I walked her up the hill at night, and at the very top of the hill, before you turn to go out to the main road, uh, is where we collect our trash for the, it's a trash bin up there. But I didn't go all the way up, but uh, the moon was shining where I could see a silhouette walking from right 
to left behind the trash bins. So I called the next morning and said, were you people out? I called all around at that time. That's your trash. And they said, no. But I, what it appeared to me to be a silhouette of a, of a Bigfoot. And then I, what I've had activity before then, we've had whoops and knocks and we were uh, sabotaged the other day. And uh, it, it, it's crazy. We have, um, if if you had uh, if you could estimate uh, uh, estimate estimate the the size of like the height of that silhouette, would you be able to say you know like six, seven, eight? Mm-hmm. Uh... It was down over the hill. Uh, there's the trash bins and then uh, a row of trees. And excuse me, at the time there were no leaves again, uh, so it was up pretty high on those trees. And I went up there the next morning to see if I could see anything stuff was tramped down, but there were no footprints. Uh, I would say between seven and eight feet tall. And then I went down over the hill to see if I could find anything. And I found structures and uh, bent over trees and X's. And there are four corners I call out here that I go in the woods and it's usually just Phoebe and I, and I don't take any cell phones or anything because it seems like if I do, I don't have any activity. So I, I went out there and, uh, oh, we've had lots of experiences. If you'd like to hear from Chris, what yeah, happened sure. here when Definitely. my granddaughter was here, Chris, Chris, <laughs> she's asleep. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to tell them about our sabotage night? Our night of being under siege. <sighs> Yeah, I can do that. Mm. <laughs> yeah, let, let, let's hear about this being under siege. That's interesting. That happened about uh, two months ago when my granddaughter Meredith was here. Okay, right. here's Chris. Yeah, we're, we're interested. All right, Chris. Uh, hey guys. Take it from, hey, Hello, Chris. Take it from here. <laughs> well, I moved here in July of last year, and one of the things you can see our feisty feist. We like to take her out once every couple of hours to do her business. And the, what's really neat about being outside is we go out our, our door of our kitchen and we have a long porch out in front of the, the house and we have two bird feeders and we have a walkway and then the grass and the wood. So if I had a if I had a tennis ball, I would just have to like toss it like I'm tossing it back to the pitcher to hit the woods. And so Phoebe goes out and she is doing her business and Meredith comes out. It's in April. And she's got her jammies on except for nothing on her feet. And she gets cold. She, she goes back inside. She's back inside no more than 30 seconds. And all of a sudden, a, down and around in the backyard. Now, take you, take this. There are no lights out here. There are no street lights in the country. Just the lights that we have, um, uh, motion lights and the lights that we turn on. And I hear coming from the back of the house this tremendous crash. There's one, and then there is another one. And just when I'm thinking, what in the, a third one, and then another two or three beat, a fourth one, and then it it went, and I'm sitting there just astounded with what I'm hearing, and then there's a fifth and maybe a sixth. I, I, I really can't tell if it was five or six, but it's pitch black out, out, out back, our um, our one neighbor that's closest to us lives up on the hill, literally right up the hill. He goes, he's in bed every night at nine o'clock. And for some reason, I just, I had to yell out. I go, Ed? <laughs> and it's pitch black, nothing. Now, if you all have watched or done a wood knock yourself out, out in the woods, you know what the echo signature of wood on wood is. It's very distinctive. You know that we hear it all the time. What I heard was like something hitting metal and we've got some old um trailers. yeah old trailers you know utility the the two trailers. the utility trailers that that are on <laughs> the old utility trailers <laughs> on on two wheels you know the ones you hitch up to a van or a truck and i thought if that is what's being hit it's it sounded to me like the hulk was back there hulk smashing the trailers but there was after that there was nothing and the weird thing is I, we were talking to our friend the other night on the phone and I said, it's very easy in life to do an arm, armchair quarterbacking. Well, in that time I would do this and I would have done that. And 
I'm sitting there experiencing what is this incredibly violent, loud attack that may be, I mean, just say it, maybe a, a Bigfoot in the backyard, maybe, you know, or or something or someone, and I'm not scared, and I'm having this surreal moment in my head where I'm going, how am I reacting to maybe being in the midst of something <laughs> paranormal or supernatural? Because you never know how you're going to react until you're in the moment. And I'm a big lover of music and movies, and I'm thinking, and, and I'm, I'm not, and I'm thinking to myself, what appropriate movie score or music score should be playing in the background <laughs> for me? You know, like, and then it shows me leaning over, and you hear the background. You know, uh, we were talking about. It. He goes, "Hey, Chris, what if you heard this?" And I'm like, "If that's a John Carpenter film, I'm running." You know, like Jason's back there hitting. I was thinking Jaws, like, duh, duh, duh. oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's another one Landshark, uh, pe- uh, pizza deliver guy, Landshark, Saturday Night Live. But, but that was just the beginning of it. And then all night long, guys, we would hear like hits on the house, like someone was punching the house. All four corners. All four corners. And one of them was so high up off the ground because. When you have a house on a slope, you know, you can, you, you walk four or five feet. And then if you've got a 30 degree downturn, next thing you take five yards, it's t- to be even, it's 10 yards up in the air. And yeah. we're hearing something where you'd have to be, what, eight, nine feet tall, at least, you know, or to be able to make, or- to hit, to hit the house back and forth all night long. And there were three reactions. Meredith was terrified. Linda was nonplussed, like, meh. You know, this is par for the course of my life. And I was pissed. I was angry because. He had a machete. So for Linda, I, for Linda was like eating a Big Mac. She was like, eh, I've done it before. I was. I was eating candy. I was eating candy. I'm a big science fiction. I'm a big science fiction fantasy fan. And one of my favorite movies growing up was Conan the Barbarian, 1982. And Arnold Sword, the, the, the sword he finds in the crypt, my ex-girlfriend bought me the replica of the sword years ago. And that has been with me my entire life since then. It's so, sitting at the front of his bedroom door. So I'm walking around with Arnold Sword. I'm walking around with Arnold Sword. And if somebody's coming after us, they're going to get swore. I'm crocheting. I'm crocheting. I'm not making Tom, Tom, I'm not making that up. That's the truth. Oh, no. I'm like, no, I somebody, love it. I love it. She sounds like my mom in the background, like just somebody is going to get swarped if they come in. It's the truth. So I actually call the police, and I call the police, and I say, I say to them, I say, "Hey, there." I said, "I I hesitate to tell you what I think it is. I I'll just tell you what it it's manifesting. I'm not going to tell you who it is. We can't see anybody outside. I've been outside to investigate." There are knocks. There are someone hitting stuff in our backyard. Our house is being physically struck. Could you send somebody out here, at least with the lights on, to provide deterrence if it's a human person? And they go, sure. And she, I, I think she said, she goes, well, sir, what do you think it is? And I said, <laughs> well. Land shark. <laughs> I said, if it's if it's not a guy and it's not a big and it's not a bear and it's not it might be a bigfoot and she said well sir i've heard that one before i said trust me i'm not on drugs and i'm not oh. drinking <laughs> i just i just know i've got my conan sword and we're going to be fine if they you try to get it and she started <laughs> laughing and, you know because at a time like that you just wonder but but we came back in the house, guys, and the and the oh. and the and the, the sheriff eventually goes by. They don't even get out of the car. They just go by very, very and the road left to the left of the house is like on a probably a twenty degree, twenty five degree grade. So they go down, turn around and then come back. They have flashlight. They shine it around. Well the knocks oh. continue. The knocks oh. continue and it's getting later and later and Meredith is beside herself. And Linda eventually says, Honey, let's just go to bed. We'll go to bed, and if anything happens, you know, I'll go upstairs and I'll get Chris. And um, I said, 
and I and I gave them a kiss goodnight, and they went downstairs. And do you care if I tell the story? No, please do. So Linda's down there with Meredith. She's <laughs> holding Meredith under the covers, and her room happens to be below my room, directly the way the floor plan is. And Linda's laying in bed, and she says, I swear to God, it sounded like somebody was throwing rocks from the inside of the room, hitting the door that was locked in her bedroom. Like from the inside activity. of the room. Like they took a handful of rocks or pebbles or something and just plastered the inside of it. Um, and Meredith said, oh, she calls me Gigi, and she said, Gigi, it's in the room. <laughs> I said, well, I'll go get Chris. Yeah, and this in this I don't I can't remember if she gave you the time, but this is April of this year. Three thirty in the morning. About three thirty. Been the... about the same time I saw Mothman. You never know. We'll so she, she comes up. upstairs and she tells me what happened. I said absolutely, and we went down and it's a is it a I'm trying to think what the mattress is. It's a queen size bed. So, so I I lay on the far left. Meredith is in the middle and Linda's on the right, and thankfully that was the end of it. We all fell asleep. Linda got up went to the potty, and then she came upstairs, and I rolled over and noticed <laughs> Meredith was asleep, but the door was open, and it scared the hell out of me. I'm thinking, oh, my God, did somebody come in and get her? Is she out there? What's going oh, on? Bring me back. So <laughs> I, I I walk out of the room, come upstairs. Did Linda, yeah, you're thinking Linda took the Conan sword, and she's headed out. I did. I was, <laughs> how dare her steal I was cutting my yarn with it, and I was <laughs> Well, how dare her steal my glory, right? <laughs> you know, that's my job. I, I want to know. But all I, I want to know, Chris. Chris, did you take your shirt off when you were holding the sword? <laughs> well, I tell you what. Five years ago, I looked like an action hero. Now I look like uh, I, I look the. Uh, uh, I'm, I, was in, I, I, there. I was in shape at one point. Now I'm out of shape. At one point, I looked like. <laughs> at one point, I looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now I look like Tom Arnold. So there's a big difference. Well, Tom Arnold just lost a bunch of weight. Did he really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, but, there's um, something to aspire to. That's what you got to do. Exactly. You want to look oh. like Schwarzenegger in his prime or Arnold when he was out of shape. Oh, uh, but the truth, the truth of the matter is, I came upstairs. And I'm walking up the stairs slowly because I want to know what's going on. I want to get the drop. If somebody's up here, I want to get the drop on. I'm not going to let them know I'm coming up. And I look over, and Mom is over there in her, I don't know if you can see it, in her chair. With my fish tank and my With her fish pepper. tank. <laughs> and she's sitting there all chilled out. And I come up, and I said, I think we all, and I can't remember which one of us said at first, but I think we both said, I think it's over. And from that point on for the night, um, it was it was smooth sailing. But one of the things that I did that that our friend Steve asked is, well, did you go outside and look around the property to look for, you know, tracks? You know, maybe if it was Bigfoot, you'll see a track. Maybe you'll see damage to the house. And this is where it turns into what I would describe maybe as a paranormal encounter because there was nothing, gentlemen, no. nothing. There was no, there would be nothing on the house that would depict the type of damage that we would have thought there would have been on the house or debris. There was nothing untoward, um, like in the back. Like, I swear to God, it sounded like um, Thor with Mjolnir was back there hitting, you know, it was that, it was that loud, but there, was, there wasn't any damage on the, on the trailer hitches. It, and I just remember saying to myself, this becomes more and more surreal all the time because what what happens already crazy enough but when you when you look at the when you go out and look for evidence to support what happened there's nothing there to support what happened um and it just we were like okay you know well how do you file this one away you know it's something we experienced we had a good laugh along the way and we made it out on the other side it didn't even right. wake up the chickens yeah <laughs> But just to tell you a little bit about my background and what brought me full circle, the, the what how we met, um, I'm from the southern uh, southern Ohio. There's a town right on the Ohio River called Ironton. In one point, it was the world's leading pig iron industry. It was a world leader, uh, and that factory is long since gone. But if you go across the uh, a bridge in Ohio into Kentucky. And then from Kentucky into West Virginia, it's a tri-state area. You can be in all three states if you get a green light in about 15, 20 minutes. So that's where I'm from. So it would be Ironton, Ohio, Ashland, Kentucky, 
Huntington, West Virginia. And I went to uh, Marshall University. Okay, 64, 64, that area. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you guys are probably familiar with We Are Marshall and the plane and the team that tragically crashed. Um, uh, sad, that's that's part of our history. Uh, that's, that's so sad. But I remember vividly when I was 10 years old, I had just got a bicycle that looked like a motocross bike. It had the fake gas tank. It's black with the flames and the big knobby tires. And my um, our alleyway was still gravel. And I think even to this day, it's still gravel where a lot of alleyways are paved. So I'm out riding my bike up and down the gravel uh, with the sweet jumps uh, we're doing and we're pretending to be motocross heroes. And we get done playing and I leave my friends and I'm coming back home and I'm getting ready to go up in the, to the garage and I just have this overwhelming need to look up in the sky. And it's an overcast day with big, big uh, clouds that are basically, you, you think it's about to rain, but it's not. It's one of those where you just feel it in the air, but it's not yet there. And I look up, guys, and I see flat on bottom, round on top dome that's about the color of a battleship floating in the sky, big as, as could be. And I remember telling people from that moment on, you know, with all the UFO presentations I've done and do, I called it my um, laundry list moment where I'm going through a laundry list, not a bird, not a plane, not Superman, not a kite. There are no dr drones in the 70s. Um, it's, it's, what is it? I mean, it's sitting there in the sky, big as, big as the world. And I can't tell you how long I remember looking up at it. And clouds would go by between my vision and it. And it would obscure it from time to time. And then the clouds would pass. It was still there. And then one particular large cl um, cloud mass went by it and it was gone. I never saw it leave. It was just gone. And that summer, I'll never forget, I saw Eric, Eric Von Donneken's book and then documentary, In Search of Ancient Astronauts. And to say that I'm hooked from that moment on, every single documentary, every single book, every single person, every every um, UFO conference I could go to, I've been to, I've met almost everyone in the business. I've got phone numbers of some of them that were good friends. Uh, I've struck up incredible relationships over the years, and I've talked to thousands of people over the last 40 years trying to figure out what it, what are UFOs, what are the phenomena. Mm -hmm. And, of course, along the way, I've been uh, caught up into, like like Mom Linda would say, the phenomenology of cryptids, of ghosts, and, and you know, uh, uh, Bigfoot, and so many other things that ghosts bump in the night. You know, and I'm a huge, huge fan of science fiction and fantasy. So it's like I was telling our friend Steve the other night, I said, you know, there are people who, it's like duck in the water. This is who I am. Mm -hmm. I am I'm a guy who just understands and loves and appreciates um, mysteries, um, the, the paranormal. I mean, it's like getting up, it's like a duck in the water. You know, for those of us, and I'm sure you guys are no different, we have this insatiable curiosity for the unknown. And unlike so many other people in science, and you know, you have to be skeptical. And I think that the number one rule is everything with a grain of salt, try and investigate it to the nth degree. And like Sherlock Holmes may say, once you've eliminated every single possibility, whatever's left over, it doesn't prove to you what it is, but it it kind of lends itself to being fantastical. And you hear these stories all throughout. You know, you, if you think about the best UFO stories, the best cryptid stories in the last 50 years, I feel like, and I wanted to ask the two of you how you all feel like, I think we're closer than we've ever been before of coming maybe to some partial answers, given that fact that the government is now openly admitting that there's technology or phenomena in the skies that, number one, we can't match the, uh, uh, technologically, that they're exhibiting physics on display that we can't match, and that we have no idea who they are. And pilots are now openly talking about their experience where 
10, 15, 20 years ago, that would be tantamount to being sanctioned or being put in Siberia forever and fined and, or prisoned. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing what has happened in that article that Leslie Kane did five years ago, and I believe in the New York Times, where there's this open discussion of what it might be. Sure. Okay. I'll, I'll give a quick answer and then we're going to slowly start to wrap this up. But uh, my answer would be it's twofold. I don't trust anything the government tells me. Not one thing. Amen. <laughs> Two, I do agree that the that we're coming. It's a very strange time. And I think it's being intentionally coming down and that everyone's fighting with each other to make it strange to maybe release this information. Is it Project Bluebeam? Is it some type of control or is it the internet is um, a device that has enabled us to connect with each other like we're doing right now to bring us closer to some type of answer? But I don't trust anything the government tells me. I can't disagree with that at all. And then m myself, I'm I'm it's not like that we're coming to a new answer. I'm going to say this a new answer. Like, I believe we've known in the past like, you know, millennia ago, over like a couple of millennia ago, you know, maybe um, ancient Egyptian time, uh, Mayans, we knew what UFOs were then. Mm. Then there was like the forget, uh, the great forgetting, you know, everything was erased, everything was removed from our knowledge, from our wisdom. Um, it was hocus pocus then. It was all crazy, you're crazy kind of thing. And it was removed. Um, but now I believe that this awakening of everybody with like Tom was saying with this, uh, with the internet, we're coming full circle. We're coming back now because we're kind of like disassociating from the government or allowing, allowing us to listen to what the government says because the government's dictated what we've, we should always learn and know. Now we're kind of like, no, we're going to do our own thing. And we're kind of coming together into communities. Like you said, you're, you're joining your, your group in circle Ohio. I forget what it was. Uh, yes. Yes. Circleville. At, Circleville. At the American Legion. That's all I know. Yeah. And, and I believe that's I believe that's right. Yeah. But these grassroots groups that you're talking about, right, are all over the country and world. Thank God for the Internet that the information is no longer being controlled by a few were to be, for example, a podcast 20, 30 years ago, unless you go through the corporate media, it's not possible. True. Now anyone in the world has a voice and can speak mm -hmm. up and share information instantaneously. It's incredible. It's kind of like blockchain. It's kind of like blockchain where there's just information right. everywhere and it's not centralized in one location. It's everywhere and everybody has this information, you know, so if something gets removed, well, another like, you know, someone's going to step in and, you know, have that information and keep supporting it and keep uh, presenting it. Yeah, but I, that's also why there's, I think, a, a, an unbelievable amount of censorship happening right now because they don't want us to know for some reason. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit conspiratorial. Right. <laughs> No, Tom, you and I could talk for hours oh, I'm about sure that. Good. I'm in a complete agreement with you where, yeah. you know, information has been suppressed forever. And, and Rye, I like where you were going because I really do believe if you, if you have any type of, you do any type of cursory research, and it doesn't take that long, I, I think it's very possible to extrapolate a few things that thousands of years ago, society all across the world went from primitive, primitive technology to building pyramids. And where does that information come from almost simultaneously where you cannot connect with other people all over the world? And, you know, the cultures come out and say it, correct me if I'm wrong, the gods from the sky came down essentially and gave us fire. They gave us technology. In, and you see that in the depiction of the hieroglyphics. And you know that ancient people did three things with hieroglyphics. They carved what they saw, they carved what they imagined, and then they carved, uh, what was the third one? I'm, I'm trying to remember what he said, but uh, what they, uh, what maybe even the future of, of what they what they wanted to see. But the point of it is there, you know, to this day, I think there's, if you really want to be honest, there's no consensus on what in the world it took to build the pyramids. There are modern day engineers that say, Hey, with an unlimited budget, given that it might have been made in 20 years, I'm not sure we could do it, let alone mortal and hammer and chisel, you know, thousands of years ago. So these questions, and I agree, I think we're coming we're full, full circle, circle to find out that we've never been <laughs> exactly alone. What? And to whatever extent that they're guiding us or have guided us or given us 
the technology that they've given us or the, our very DNA is up for grabs. And I think it's an exciting time to be alive, yeah. to be curious, to try and figure out what's going on. It, it's exciting. I, I can't think of a more worthy pursuit beyond the things that we pursue in medicine and technology and providing for our families. What's the next great thing to do? Who are we? Where did we come from? And, and where are we, are we going? going? You know, yeah. and I love it. And thank, 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 the, you. thank you all so much for being a big part of the piece of the pie to ask these questions mm -hmm. and get people's stories and information out there. And between, hopefully with all of us talking to one another, it, yeah, there's no doubt about it. Like, so yeah. thank you. No, no, no. We want to thank you guys. This was, this was amazing. This was this by far my my fav favorite <laughs> interview I've had. And that's it was, a word. That's, that's a word. Uh, that's a that's word. Look it up. Like look that. it up. <laughs> uh, all, all I got to say is like, like, you know, it's been an hour and 15 minutes and I, I could keep going and and I, I definitely want to oh, have I definitely want to have you guys back. Like like Chris, I feel that I it. feel that we just like touched the surface of the amount of information that you have. And I, I, I want to hear a lot more. Oh, without a doubt. And then and then um Oh for sure. Oh, I love it. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> and then Linda, like I, I want to hear more stories about, you know, your mediumship, you know, and your your empathic and psychic abilities. Like yeah. so much more. It's like we, we we could have had like two separate interviews with you both and we still would need more. Yeah, and Chris, I want to thank you oh, there's no doubt. for the most like hair raising and funniest story. <laughs> you you had tears coming out of my eyes. And Linda, <laughs> Linda, at the beginning, uh, I want to ask you a question. It's uh, you said that uh, one of us is good looking. Who's better? Uh, who's better looking? Is it Rye or me? <laughs> oh, I think you're twins. I think so. Oh, yeah. There we go. Oh, there's no way in the world she's going to. It's just a shame I'm not younger. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's, that's a Sophie's choice she's not going to make, oh, guys. you got to know that. All right, all right. Okay. Well, I guess no one's being thrown under the bus tonight. Exactly. Right, exactly. Smart answers. Smart answers. Smart answers. Smart answers. Well, we we want to thank you, you guys. You have fun down there. And you have fun for we me. Had great, we had a great, we had a blast talking with both of you. Yeah. We did. We, we, we certainly did. And we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts that you both came on oh, and had a no, good time you. with us because yeah. we had a great thank time. I, I did too. You just let us know when and where in the future we'd love to be back on. 100%. You guys are the best. And, and you know, feel free to jump in. Like I know, uh, Linda, you're on her Facebook commenting all the time. And we extremely appreciate that. And Chris, if you're on Facebook, Thank come on in, man. And uh, I am excellent. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I, I shouldn't tell you this, but I, I can't help it. I'm going to put a picture of me and the Conan sword on. <laughs> yes. It, it I, I don't know. I don't know what title we should call this episode. You know, like Mothman prof, like Mothman or like Conan, Moth Conan versus Mothman. the Bigfoots. Conan versus That's Mothman. Yes. I'll draw you a picture. <laughs> the Conan sword was going to swerp a Bigfoot if he came around the corner and he was aggressive. Exactly. You know, I, actually, <laughs> guys, I got it. I know we're cutting, we're cutting it down, but that metal sound. I have a question about that metal clanking sound. Oh. Yeah. So that echo signature. Yes. It, like I've heard from other, uh, we had uh, like uh, other it. people yeah, that, that is it. like a sound of a portal. They say that sometimes that's a sound oh, of a really? portal. Oh, really? Yes. Ooh. A what, what, you, portal you know, opening. I heard that. Yes. Why that would explain no physical, oh, yeah. no, no, no evidence. Uh -huh. Of, of of a physical contact then yes you know because a portal correct me if i'm wrong portal's probably not going to leave physical trace right it's energy it's whatever yeah, it is it's not going to be like splinters of wood or metal shavings chris could you describe the sound maybe with a little more context since we're here in this corner of the well conversation it, tom it was just it was so and the thing that blew my mind it was so loud and but it had, you know, and again, like I say, that wood knock is so distinctive. Right. It had more of a clanging cracking mm -hmm. than it had that thud, that that distinct wood on wood thud. It, it sounded to me literally, and I couldn't tell if the object itself was metal or what was being struck was with, with metal, but it definitely had an echo signature. And you know what I'd love to do is go out and basically experiment and pick up various objects and try to reproduce it. I've not done Linda, that. Linda, could you videotape, I'd videotape like to that too? And, <laughs> yeah. No, use the Conan sword. Yeah. Yeah. You got to hit it, hit it with the Conan sword. Hit it with the Conan make, sword. Make some, yeah. make some sparks fly off. That'd be great. Oh, my God. But, 
you know, like I said, when I was listening to that, I just had that surreal moment where I was laughing. I said, <laughs> I might be in the middle of a paranormal Bigfoot thing. And I'm like, what music should be playing in my, in the soundtrack of my life in the background? I, I, I'll, I'll never forget that. Like, how would you react if you were ever in a situation that mo you hear these stories from people say, and I was in it and, and I've made it to the other side. It was funny. What I heard was like, I was in the woods and I was walking the creek and I had the dog and I was sure I was going to walk up on somebody that was pitching a tent. It was that metal, you know, bang, bang, bang. I was like, who's pitching a tent for you out here in the woods? Jesus. <laughs> I love how she's so unaffected by it and laughing and Chris yeah. is scared to death. And he's like, oh, and Chris, he's a Chris guy. The, the, oh, the music you need playing is Indiana Jones. That's it. Hey, that's uh, it. We're going to go with that one. Not, thank like you say thank Thanks god it's it's an adventure film and not a horror film i can handle that exactly exactly there's no, there's no doubt i know guys like you said uh right we got to wrap it up we don't want to we don't want you going any further than you have to we want to respect the time but it's been an absolute blast you guys are the best and thank you thank you so much thank you that was so we kind really of you appreciate the opportunity. we appreciate it too so, so thank you guys kind so much of you to say so thank you very much we appreciate that we're going to hang tight yes. all right we, we'll hang tight while you do the usual. All right, man. Thank you, guys. <laughs>well, that was Linda and Chris, and you know, holy crap, that was a, a mind blowing uh, episode. What do you think about that one, Tom? I, uh, I I really liked it. I really, really, really liked it. They were just the most friendliest, down to earth people that there was. I found them to be genuinely wonderful and full of life and vibrant. And their stories, um, you know, you you use all the words. They blew my mind. It made me question my reality. But uh, she. And they had us. Uh, they had us in in tears as well. Actually, uh, well, at least Chris did, but, and, and Linda as well too. Yeah, the, like she was. You can see that the she. You know, because we see the you know the video. We're talking to these people basically. Well, not face to face, but through the through the um, through the Riverside FM app. A free a free little plug there, and uh, <laughs> and you can see that she was really like making sure that she told us because she had regression. Yeah, she was doing a regression type therapy thing. Yeah. You can see that she's got a million things going through her mind and at the same time trying to weave them together for us. And I actually wrote down in my book, the timelines match perfectly. Like what she's saying makes so much sense. And it, it, it weaves a wonderful, crazy tale. Uh, what, yeah. do you, what did you think? It, it, I don't know. Best. <laughs> it's, yeah, exactly. I, I, I'm kind of speechless. I was just like, I don't know because it was, like I said, before. this is my... My favorite interview so so far. I was so impressed, and and Chris's story though about running around with Conan, uh, like Conan the Barbarian, there was uh, was was pretty damn funny. Um, he told but, the policeman that he thought it was Bigfoot outside. Yeah, exactly, He's exactly. There with the sword. Well, <laughs> <laughs> he told the police that. <laughs> oh my god! But uh, and then Linda, you know, when she what when she did talk about her regression, you know, you, you could see that it actually affected her emotionally. You know, she she changed a little bit with her demeanor. You know, it was like something that was affected. You know, right. something that was affecting her. Yeah, that's what I was telling her. I, I, I could see it, and I told her, "Hey, why don't you know you've been talking for whatever forty minutes?" I said, "Why don't you have a glass of water?" You know, I was just trying to be supportive of it, and I told her it's a lot to come through when you like don't remember it, but then it like, and I'm sure when you regress, you're saying it out. But then it actually hits home a little bit later. And she said it was five years. And she said she didn't want to do it again. And I can definitely understand that. Well, she was, yeah, she was saying like, you know, not only did she was able to hear it through the regression, but the mem the actual memories then came back. Like everything came back at that right. point. She yeah. remembered it, you know, so. But then she lightened up. And then when he was, they were, you know, the story that Chris told that had us all in stitches including Linda, myself, and I'm doubled over with tears coming out of my eyes. You know, my favorite kind of interviews <laughs> and you could, uh, you could, she kind of like when he's freaking out, she's like laughing and she's like, yeah, this is just par for the course. Exactly. I, this is, this is nothing. You should just, Hey, there was a, there's a Volkswagen ball of light that talked to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's like, yeah, yeah, mom, you're, you're right. So uh, Bigfoot put me back in the car. I'm, I'm good to go. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah. And we're, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed them as much as we did. We're definitely, 
definitely going to have them back on. And hopefully, um, oh yeah, like like Chris, you could tell that he is full of information and stories. He has you know a plethora, plethora smorgasbord of stories, and I know Linda has got a lot more too. You know, she kind of said that you know after that Mothman experiences, things started ramping up, and even now she says like her gifts, um, her like mediumship type gifts mm-hmm. are opening as well. So I'd love to delve into that a little bit more. Um, in the future, of course. But, of course, uh, of course. And remember, we release these episodes every Thursday. Once again, don't forget to share them. Don't forget to like them. Don't forget to, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to comment. And don't forget to hit us up. You know, we have, we have an email address. That's the Lost Frequency Podcast at gmail.com. You can yeah. contact me, Tom Franklin, on uh, on uh, Facebook or... Or Rye Voss on Facebook as well. Um, or like Tom said, you can find us on Facebook. We have our Facebook group. Also, you know... We love to hear your stories, so send them to us. And even if you, even if you don't think you have enough of a story to be like interviewed, we read them out on our on our episodes, and that's not a problem. Um, also, I'm sure you can hear in the background. You know, we have some cars driving by, some dogs barking, and we haven't yeah, said it for a I couple think the episodes. Dogs are over there playing. Was it what, what they used to play? Was it playing pool? Dogs playing pool. That <laughs> playing picture? poker. They're playing some play poker. poker. Yeah. yeah, but it's in Mexico, so that you know they're maybe he's playing poker and he's yelling, "Hit me, hit me!" You know. Yeah. Yeah, and the other one's like, you want me to hit you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we really appreciate that, really appreciate that you yes. guys are listening to it. And I hope and like, you, it, uh, like Tom said, you know, yeah. share it with your friends uh, however you feel like you want to share it, you know? Like last time we said throw a brick through, uh, you know, again, someone's siding. Maybe this time, I don't know. Don't say throw a brick through someone's siding. Yeah, throw a brick onto someone's siding, you know, um, not through the window. Because you, you were saying throw a brick through someone or rock through someone's window. So this time you changed it. I said not to do that, didn't I? You did, but then you said maybe deciding. Deciding. Oh, well, you, you, that's right. I haven't listened to that mix down yet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, by the way, I forgot that uh, we also have a YouTube channel. If you'd like to listen to it, you know, see a couple pictures, you know what we look like. Uh, you can uh, subscribe on there too. and uh, you Leave know, us some and, comments. And, and uh, enjoy the, enjoy the uh, interview that way. 100%. Yeah. And once again, we want to thank you guys for listening. This is the Lost Frequency Podcast where we bring the periphery into focus. We close with good night, good luck, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth.